All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome back. I'm glad to uh, be with you virtually yet again as we continue our um, course on ethics this semester. Um, thanks, everybody, first of all, for all your preparation and study for the midterm exam um, that you just did. I'm currently uh, in the process of grading those, and I'll have the scores ready, and I'll send them back to each student um, within the next week. So just take a little bit of extra time. We have a little more time uh, before the next assignment is due. So um, that affords us a little breathing room to uh, you know, focus on the next topic in the class. And you can just uh, hang in there for a minute as I finish off scoring the, um, the recent midterm test. But now we're halfway through the course. You know, We took one test. We had one essay. The part two, second half of the class uh, is really much the same. It's just we have another essay prompt that I'll distribute in a while after we talk about a few more course subjects. And then uh, there will be the final exam, which is much similar to the midterm, um, just with an expanded study guide that contains more possible subjects and test questions to account for the new material that we will all be uh, learning in the second half of our semester. So um, up to this point, we've covered a lot of interesting terrain. You know, we started by just um, going into a general overview of ethical theory. We learned about the different um, prevailing theories in the West on ethics. So for example, utilitarian ethics from John Stuart Mill, which says the right action is whatever creates the most overall happiness as compared with the deontological ethical system of Immanuel Kant and his Kantian framework, which says that you should act from a sense of duty to abide by the moral law, which can be expressed and understood through the different forms of the categorical imperative um, and then after that, we focused on the abortion um, debate for a while. We, lo we looked at authors um, that make pro-life and pro-choice arguments. Um, Marianne Warren, uh, Michael Tooley, Judith Jarvis Thompson, pro-choice authors, John Noonan, um, Don Marquis, pro-life authors with different viewpoints and, uh, you know, um, premises that try to establish their conclusion that abortion either is or is not morally permissible. And, um, we also looked at drug use, legalization, prohibition, criminalization, and everything in between. So um, the topic of different theories of criminalization came up, you know, what justifies making an act criminal? Uh, on what basis do people argue that it's justifiable to criminalize drugs? Is it because it could harm others, the, the drug user or addict? Is it because it just harms the individual themselves? Is it because it violates some kind of general moral standard of right and wrong that people have, regardless of whether it harms anybody? So some authors like, um, you know, James Q. Wilson and also Gerald Dworkin argued that either because it could harm others or maybe because it falls within the range of justified paternalistic law uh, that it could be permissibly prohibited. And then we saw the author uh, Douglas Husack uh, argue to the contrary uh, that we have a moral right to use drugs, but he also tried to state all the different utilitarian reasons why uh, the anti-drug status quo, he doesn't think, generates the best overall results. And then we took a little bit of time, just one meeting, to talk briefly about a mini topic in the course, which is uh, genetic engineering and human cloning. We learned about what those technologies are, how they could be used to modify or um, the genetic material of human beings to either treat or prevent disease, but also, more controversially, to enhance people beyond normal levels of function or to uh, select qualities that you would like them to have in terms of you know, intellectual, moral, or phenotypical traits. Um, so we also talk about human cloning, what that is, reproductive cloning, when you clone an adult subject uh, by creating a genetically identical copy of them. Um, we talked about the process that achieves that, which is somatic cell nuclear transfer, and some of the ethical concerns uh, that that could also pose. But we also talked about what benefits it could potentially offer in terms of giving infertile or otherwise childless individuals, a chance to have a genetically related child, to bypass a genetic disease, to clone specific tissues or organs for transplantation purposes, or, you know, et cetera. And then we talked about uh, John Harris's argument that um, enhancement, genetic enhancement, even he thought if it was safe and effective, that it should be something that's both permissible and even obligatory in a future world where that becomes a widespread norm. And he gave this like aviation analogy to help support his thought. Um, he feels that there's no hard and fast distinction between attempts to use um, science and technology to uh, treat and prevent disease as opposed to enhance because today's uh, enhancement is tomorrow's normal. 
And that's kind of the way he argued. So now we find ourselves on the other side of the midterm and we're kind of coming down the mountain into the second half of the course. Um, so we've got some new subjects and the new topic that uh, we're introducing just now, which is gonna occupy us for a couple of lessons, a couple of uh, lectures anyway. It's war, terrorism, and torture. Another interesting, highly charged, you know, debated subject area in uh, contemporary ethics, and really not just contemporary ethics, but ethics over uh, the generations going way back into the past. People have debated the morality, the ethics, the moral permissibility or lack thereof of, uh, of war. Um, so the main point will be war, but we'll also touch on a couple of other related components there. For example, you can see it listed terrorism. Uh, could terrorism ever be given any kind of even theoretical justification? If so, on what basis? If not, why not? And um, torture, you know, the, uh, to me, you know, obviously really disgusting and abhorrent practice of torturing a person. Perhaps uh, we'll talk more about the specific context in which torture could happen, but is there any conceivable justification that could be offered for torture? We're going to not spend as much time talking about the torture issue, really, uh, but we'll heavily uh, focus on and center around the debates and the historical debates going back on the moral permissibility or justification of war. Um, and that will kind of spill over into the terrorism realm as well. Just taking a little sparkling water there. Thanks, guys. OK, so obviously the issue of war, terrorism, and torture um, is one with direct relevance to all of us today. Because we know that in the past um, you know, 20 years or so, um, starting with the war in Iraq, uh, the United States, well, the second war in Iraq, not the original Gulf War, but the invasion led by W. Bush. Um, we've seen the United States involved in a number of big international conflicts and continuing on to the current day. So we had the war in Afghanistan after 9-11, and then uh, that went on for so long. And we recently just, you know, uh, ended the mission and extracted our leftover troops. There was the war in Iraq. Um, we've had military um, engagements in parts of the Middle East and Africa um, on smaller missions, and in some cases, um, unmanned aerial drones have been used to both surveil and conduct military operations in all kinds of places. Um, <clears throat> we have, uh, you know, of course, been given a lot of military and uh, logistical support to Ukraine in their current conflict with, uh, with Russia, which is kind of like a proxy conflict between the whole West and um, Russia. And uh, there's also the prospect of possible future wars that you know we can never necessarily um, ignore the possibility of. For example, if we went to war with uh, North Korea, a nuclear armed nation that sometimes makes belligerent threats to the United States, or could we ever break out into war with, say, like Iran, uh, who many people think are developing missile, Western, uh, missile or uh, nuclear programs um, that could be weaponized. Um, so anyway, we discuss the morality of these issues. And there's some big basic questions that have to be addressed. So let me just list off a few of the major questions, uh, the moral questions that are of interest. So moral questions that we will consider, that people debate, that they take different views about. One could be, is war ever morally justified? Okay, one question. Is war ever morally justified? Um, and separate, related, but could terrorism ever be morally justified? Is war ever morally justified? Could terrorism ever possibly be morally justified? Um, and of course, could torture? So ditto, you know, just a little uh, ellipses, torture. Could it ever be morally justified alongside these other questions about war and terrorism? Now, um, I'm sure it might seem to be perhaps um, obvious, but let's just try to make everything very explicit. Um, can any of you that are watching this imagine why somebody might pose these difficult questions? Um, what is it about war, for example, 
that raises at least um, common sense moral problems or objections. I would say that probably if you're thinking this, um, you've got the right idea. Clearly, war um, involves massive destruction, you know, and it involves killing. It involves the destruction of life, property, um, uh, and territorial integrity. It breaks up families and uh, destroys nations even. So we all know that um, it's not good to do something evil. And war, terrorism, and torture are evil things in the sense that in a perfect world, none of them would exist. In a perfect world, a most well-ordered and just um, status quo would not include people killing each other, fighting wars, engaging in acts of terrorism, or torturing other human beings. So really the question is not whether these things are good, because in no way are they good. Even I think the people who support the moral permissibility of these acts would not say that they're generally good. The real question is, are they sometimes like a necessary evil, as they say? Is there any case where we are justified morally in knowingly doing something that is prima facie of evil or bad? War, terrorism, and torture are great evils in the same way that pain is in general an evil thing, or starvation, not to be desired, not to be hoped for, but is there ever a kind of context or is there ever a set of conditions that provides a moral defense or justification for these like inherently non-ideal, uh, to put it very lightly, um, forms of interaction and human behavior. Now, when it comes to war anyway, the first big question and the one that really is mostly our focus, um, there are three major positions on the morality or the ethical justification of war. So I'm gonna now talk to you about those. We can clear away this information to make room for more. <clears throat> All right, then, so here's one big question that we definitely wanna grapple with. Um, what are the different positions that a person can take on the ethical justification of war? And like I was just mentioning, there's three. So let's learn then, what are three major main positions on the ethical justification of war? Okay, so one of the three main positions is what we call realism. Realism, out of the three, is the one that has the most, um, that is the most accepting of war, the one that doesn't, uh, you know, characterize it in a, in a fundamentally bad or wrong way. Because what realism says, <clears throat> the viewpoint here is that morality does not apply to war. The only questions that matter, the only questions that have any relevance when war breaks out are not moral questions, but rather uh, tactical questions, meaning does the given action advance the aims of the state that's engaged in the conflict? So that's realism. There's no moral questions, moral, morality, right and wrong, and all that. It just goes out the window when war happens. They say morality does not pertain to war, and the only relevant questions are questions of whether a given act advances the aims of the state. Okay, so here's the view. So I've just written that, and I'll read it off again. It says here, well, the heading, three main positions on the morality war. This is just the first of three. Realism, this position says that morality doesn't apply to war. The only relevant question is whether a given act advances the aims of the state, whether it uh, brings them closer to achieving victory or whether it takes them further away from that. That's the only real relevant question. Don't ask, for example, whether it was right or wrong for this to be done. So suppose that a civilian bridge is blown up in a conflict, um, and by definition, civilians would have commuted across this bridge to get to their jobs, their homes, or whatever else to get supplies. Um, and in the effort of the war, one of the countries fighting it blows the bridge up to deny it like a supply route for um, military convoys also. Now, 
Um, supposedly by doing that, there's like all kinds of damage to the local communities and to everyday people that are not fighting in the war and their interests. Um, is it right or wrong for them to attack this civilian bridge, which is not necessarily a military target? Well, the realist would say that let's not ask the moral question because it just doesn't pertain. Only ask whether blowing up such bridge uh, gets the goal of the victory for the warring state closer to being achieved or not. Now, I would say realism is a pretty, um, you know, a tough viewpoint, and it's not necessarily sensitive to all the moral complexities that many people see in war. I mean, even in war, there are international laws and norms, of rules of engagement. Um, it's not supposed to be totally indiscriminate and all-out slaughter, uh, as bad as war is. There's still supposed to be certain very broad rules that apply to it. So many people criticize the realist position for saying, look, there still have to be at least some uh, standards of morality that we bring to warfare so that it doesn't become total savagery and brutality. Um, but the realist just refuses to uh, accept any kind of moral evaluation of actions taken in war. Why would anybody say that? Well, let me try to give you some of the deeper theoretical basis for why people might choose to be a realist or think this way. Um, some of them say that war is just a sort of inevitable outgrowth of human social organization. It's just a part of what happens when human beings form up into, um, you know, tribes, clans, nations, and then eventually establish national borders. Uh, you might think that inevitably war is seen throughout all human history. It seems to be like a, a significant uh, repetitive uh, outcome of various human societies forming and competing for their interests. So someone might say war is just an inevitable fact of the human form of life, and because of that, it can't be judged morally any more than other natural phenomena could be judged morally. Okay, so consider this. If a earthquake hit, you might say the earthquake was terrible. It killed a lot of people or it damaged a lot of property, but it would make no sense to say the earthquake was evil or like shame on the earthquake or the earthquake was bad and wrong and uh, it ought not to have happened. You know, because it's something that can't be um, the subject of a moral evaluation because it's not done with any intention and it's something that's just sort of like a natural fact. Um, I could be upset that it rained uh, on my uh, birthday for my birthday party, um, but I can't be like uh, morally outraged that it rained because I, it's not the same thing as a person taking action subject to their intention and will. So um, if it's true that war is just a kind of fact of nature or something, then some people might be tempted on that basis to say it doesn't have any fair way to be judged morally. On the other hand, though, I, me, myself, I'm not really a member of this camp. I can see why maybe some people could be drawn to it, but I think it just ignores the fact that a war, despite the repeated and persistent occurrence of them throughout history, it's not the same thing as um, bad weather or an earthquake. It's something that happens because of human beings individually and collectively making decisions. Uh, using what I would argue is free will. So um, we should still, I think, be held morally accountable in some sense to our decisions, and even if those decisions are large-scale, like wartime decisions, uh, there's some room to make criticisms, and some wars are conducted with more or less honor than others. So I think that we still bring our moral judgment to bear on war. Anyway, that's one position, realism. Now, the opposite of realism, the sort of opposite position out of these three, um, so now we're going to get to the most opposed to war of the three. In the, we just spoke about the one that has the most general support for the idea. What about the one that expresses the most opposition? So on the other side of the uh, divide here, we have anti-war pacifism. Anti-war pacifism. So anti-war pacifism says that... Um, all war is morally impermissible. So like all participation in and execution of war is wrong. So war is always morally impermissible. Okay, a little scrunch there, but that's the word impermissible if you might not be able to read it. You know what, I don't wanna leave it at that. Let me re rewrite it so that it's more legible. Okay, so impermissible, thank you. 
Jeez. War is always morally impermissible. Clear enough? It's always wrong. In other words, it's not morally permitted. So war in every case is wrong. So says the anti-war pacifist. We're going to talk a lot more about pacifism as we continue going through this unit of the course. And we're going to speak about debates as to whether pacifism is uh, the right moral standpoint or not. But a pacifist is a person who does not believe in killing and violence. And a specifically anti-war pacifist is a person who thinks that war is wrong and they refuse to participate in it, engage in it, or support it. Um, the root of the word pacifism is um, to pacify, and um, that's to make something gentle and less um, violent or belligerent. When we give a child a pacifier, you know, it's something that makes them stop crying. Uh, we say that we live near the Pacific Ocean, and that actually means it's the more peaceful uh, waters as opposed to like the choppier Atlantic waters. So a person that's a pacifist believes in peace as opposed to war, and they don't want to support it or be a personal um, participant in it. Anti-war pacifists hold that very strong and clear standpoint that war is always wrong. To be an anti-war pacifist, war, you think, is never morally justified. All wars are wrong, they think, even some of those that we would probably have more sympathy for. Because obviously some wars are not waged by aggressors, but sometimes they're participated in for reasons of self-defense against aggression. But if you're an anti-war pacifist, you believe that on balance war is so bad and it causes so much harm that there's no side of a war that's innocent and it's always morally um, irreprehensible and wrong. Uh, even those that are more popular or even those that you could generate probably more um, you know, of a reasonable argument for. The anti-war pacifist, why would they hold that position? Uh, maybe they think it's wrong because it violates rights, the right to life, for example, or maybe they think it's wrong because it always has worse consequences um, in, in total than positive consequences. Uh, so you could argue uh, for anti-war pacifist on a more deontological Kantian basis by saying somehow it like violates human rights or violates the categorical imperative, or maybe you could be more like a, a, a John Stuart Mill utilitarian who thinks that if you just added up uh, the total benefits and costs, it's always going to be more total costs than benefits for overall human happiness than the alternative of not going to war. Um, but of course, just as we spoke about criticisms of the realist view, there are definitely some criticisms that can be made of the anti-war pacifist view too. Uh, maybe you may be thinking of this, but I would say, the most obvious criticism is that if the pacifist believes so firmly in the right to not be killed or the right to not have violence done unto someone, obviously that must be part of their motivation for being a pacifist because what else would draw you to pacifism? It would have to be some very um, strong belief within you that it's wrong to engage in violence because people have every right not to have violence imposed on them. But consider this, if you really thought the right to life was that important and sacred, then don't you think that to be consistent, you would have to argue that you have the right to defend this sacred right to life, even uh, somewhat ironically by means of lethal force if needed to prevent an even greater loss of life? You know, so imagine someone is a pacifist in the personal sense, and they see that there's a, like a mass shooter out there killing a bunch of people, and you know they have a clear line of sight to uh, hit this person kill them and prevent them from causing further death and destruction. You know, not an unrealistic scenario at all, as we've seen tragically happening often in our own country. So um, they've got this clear shot, they could take them out, stop them from further violence, but they withhold on the act because they say, but I'm a pacifist and I can't be responsible for killing someone, I just don't believe in killing. Uh, well, because of their expression of belief that it's wrong to kill, they're actually allowing more killing going on than if they would be willing to, um, you know, make an exception to their general standpoint uh, for the sake of minimizing the overall loss of life here. So, you know, the anti-war pacifist has, I think, a fair-minded position, but it's also something that's subject to criticism, and the main criticism is kind of like that, where people will say that it seems to be somewhat of a contradiction to profess, on the one hand, this powerful belief in nonviolence, but on the other hand, saying that people should not be morally permitted to do what's necessary to repel a violent attack or even a lethal attack um, if they had the opportunity to do that. And again, another way to criticize this is on the utilitarian basis. If you think that um, it's always been the case that war has caused more harm than good, maybe then another way to criticize or uh, object to this would be to identify some cases where war seems to have caused more benefit than harm, and that would tend to 
you know, contradict the uh, anti-war pacifists' claim. Okay, so then we've talked about two of our three main positions on the morality of war, but we still have one more big one that we have to cover, and this is probably the biggest of the three in the sense that it's got the most academic and historical support, because it's sort of an intermediate position. It's neither firmly in the camp of war is always wrong, nor is it firmly in the camp of there's nothing you can criticize about war in any case. It's somewhat straddling that divide by saying that some wars are permissible and some wars are not, but it's a case-by-case -case basis depending on whether the individual war satisfies certain conditions that can be, that can be uh, stated. So the third position is what's known as just war theory, okay? <clears throat> Just, as in the sense of justice, just war theory. This is uh, the view that some wars are morally permitted uh, if they can satisfy um, certain conditions, okay? Okay, so that says just war theory, colon, now we get the definition. Some wars are morally permissible, not all. Some, why or when, as long as they satisfy certain conditions. Okay, so the realist view was like war is never wrong. And the anti-war pacifist view was war is always wrong. And this view is saying um, it depends like on the war and whether that specific war meets these criteria, meets these given conditions. These conditions then that are, now we're gonna fully you know, articulate them, but the conditions of just war theory are those that are supposed to be necessary in order for a war to be something that's morally supported, uh, morally permissible, okay? Let me tell you then more about the whole just war theory and then we're gonna dive right into that. <clears throat> okay, so just war theory, let's learn about that. Now this theory, um, it's got actually a long, uh, rich tradition in, in uh, Western history. It goes all the way back to this important uh, medieval scholar and theologian who later was canonized as a saint in the uh, Christian church. And this is known as St. Thomas Aquinas. So we give credit to St. Thomas Aquinas for having established the basic framework of the just war theory. So here's a man's name. Saint is his you know, uh, title for the fact he was canonized as a saint. So St. Thomas Aquinas. A-Q-U-I-N-A-S, Aquinas, his last name. Now, he lived uh, quite a while ago, 1225 to 1274 uh, A.C.E., you know, Common Era. So that's about, he was born about 800 years ago. This is 2023 right now, so minus 800 would have been 1223. He was born 798 years ago in the medieval period. And um, about Mr. Aquinas, so he... Um, is considered an important scholar for a few different reasons. So he was a, you know, trained as a theologian in the Christian church. And um, during the time that he lived, the church was kind of like the dominant institution in the West, kind of fused together with the state um, to enforce religious orthodoxy in all aspects of higher learning. So if you had learned things in higher study, the equivalent of college today, you would have had those lessons tied together with religious lessons uh, and instructions all the way along. There wouldn't have been this separation of, say, church and state like what we have today. Those things would have been integrated. So um, and the time we lived, there wasn't much academic attention that had been paid to the old classics of the Greek philosophers from prior to the Christian era. But Aquinas uh, went back and studied texts from, say, like Aristotle especially, who he was a big fan of. And these ancient Greek texts, he brought them back and he revived them for a European and Western audience um, in the medieval period here. 
And he tried to put somewhat of a Christian veneer on a lot of these, um, you know, pre-Christian Greek philosophical works. But even by doing that, he kind of pr brought them back uh, out to the academic and intellectual community. So in a way, it helped to preserve continuity from the old Greek masters of philosophy and so on to the medieval period. And then, of course, that continued to influence the Renaissance and the modern era that followed after it. Um, one of the things that he was known for doing would be to try to um, explain things philosophically that he thought he could uh, justify on religious grounds. So the Bible doesn't give specific guidance on every aspect of human life. And he thought that he could use philosophical um, reason and critical thinking to interpret what God would have wanted us to do in areas where it was not spelled out so literally in the Bible. So like in other works of Aquinas, he talks about um, what he thought was natural law theory. And that is like how he thought sexual interactions would be morally permissible by God, including in those areas that were not specified in the Bible's written text, um, you know, itself. Um, so he tried to develop, you know, here's what he thinks God would have wanted or not wanted us to do when it comes to the matter of human sexual um, interaction. Um, but anyway, he also was interested in the question of warfare. And um, the Bible doesn't lay out explicit criteria for when and whether um, participation in war is morally permissible. So St. Thomas Aquinas thought by looking at the Bible and integrating it with other aspects of philosophy that he knew, maybe he can infer what would have been God's um, approved way of waging war. So anyway, the just war theory first articulated by Thomas Aquinas is an attempt to state what conditions would have to be met for war to be so much morally justified that even God himself would be like, okay, this is an acceptable case of war. It's happening in a way that does not defy my will. Okay, so the original roots of just war theory have a kind of theological connection. The idea being that um, God would be willing to authorize a war if it was waged on these types of bases or principles. Um, but anyway, the influence of the just war theory has far surpassed its uh, initial you know, written form by Aquinas. It's really influenced a all generations that have followed thinking about war and many of our international laws and rules that uh, govern the conduct of war are based on um, just war theory principles that were first given by Aquinas. So anyway, I'm just a little mini uh, sidebar history lesson, just so that you know a little bit of factual information about this author who is the sort of granddaddy father figure of the just war theory. But anyway, now let's really get into the just war theory itself. Uh, apart from the author who wrote about it. So in just war theory, there are two sets of principles that they say will have to be met in order for the resort to war and the uh, waging of war to be morally permissible. So two sets of principles uh, govern the morality of war. And in order for war to be morally acceptable, all these conditions will have to be met. So he divides the principles into two separate sets. And... Um, one set of principles he calls just ad bellum conditions, and the other set of principles he calls the just in bellum conditions. So now I will talk to you guys a little bit more about all that. <clears throat> so just war theory principles. <clears throat> Two sets of principles, okay? So the first set of principles that are following uh, under just war theory are called uh, just ad bellum, okay? That's J-U-S, just, ad, A-D, and then the word bellum, B-E-L-L-U-M. That's all Latin, and what it means translated into English is the justice of going to war, okay? So I'll put that translation here. The justice of going to war. Okay, now, apart from that, the other set of principles that are inside of just war theory are called just in bellow principles. Okay, that's J-U-S, just, in, I-N, bellow, B-E-L-L-O, 
Okay, and so just in bello means the justice of the conduct within the war. Okay, just had bellum, justice of going to the war in the first place, and then just in bellow, the justice, the morality of the conduct inside the war that's already been launched, okay? Um, in Latin, the word uh, bello, in the root here, you see in bellum, that has to do with war and uh, fighting war. We have many words that kind of make use of that cognate or that root in our own language, say if a person's being bellicose, then we think that they're yelling and being angry, and that means they're being warlike. So B-E-L-L, -L, it's related to that. Or in other cases, we say someone's being belligerent, and B-E-L-L -L is the prefix there from, again, Latin, meaning that they're being warlike and combative. So ad means going to. So the justice of going to war and the justice of conduct in, in that war. Um, so to be even more precise, these conditions are conditions that would have to be met for the initiation of the war to be morally permissible, for the launching, for the starting of the war uh, to be morally permitted. And these are the conditions that govern whether the conduct within the war that's already been launched is morally permissible. And these two sets of principles are logically distinct, they're independent, because it's possible for, say, a war to be launched on a moral basis, but then for the conduct of the soldiers within the war to be morally um, bad. And on the other hand, we can see the opposite combination, where uh, even if the war was launched on a bad basis, the conduct of the soldiers within it is morally just and, um, you know, praiseworthy. The worst case scenario would be neither. The war was not launched on a justified basis, and the conduct of the soldiers within it is also unacceptable. Um, you know, like a war of aggression fought against the neighboring country just to seize their land, um, that would not be a justified basis to go. And then suppose that while they're fighting the war, they're killing women and children, indiscriminately launching attacks on hospitals and civilian infrastructure. That would be in impermissible conduct inside the war, too. But you can imagine a war being launched on a proper basis, where the conduct of the soldiers is bad. Or you can imagine a war that was um, launched in a bad way, but the soldiers conduct themselves honorably. Of course, the best case scenario is when both uh, are met, that people have launched the war on a justified moral basis, and also the conduct of the soldiers that then participate and wage the war is, is acceptable too. But these are sets of principles, guys. So there's yet a further little layer of uh, complexity. As we unpack all this, we now have to go into the two sets of principles and explain what all of them are. So the just ad bellum set, we're gonna go over that first. That's more extensive. There are six separate conditions that fit on, within this box of just ad bellum conditions. And then there are two specific um, principles that fit into this bucket of just in bello um, conditions. So we will start then with the first set of principles, the just ad bellum. That means again, we're going to hear about what would have to be the case for the initiation of a war to be a morally acceptable choice. Okay, so let's do that next. <clears throat> Okay, so here we have then the just ad bellum conditions of just war theory. Okay, just ad bellum conditions. First condition is called legitimate authority. Making the heading a little bit more specific, just ad bellum conditions. Okay, so first off, number one, legitimate authority. Let me then explain the legitimate authority requirement or condition. The name, I think, is a big hint, kind of gives it away. But what legitimate authority requires from the nation that's launching that war is that war has to be declared by a legitimate authority. That means people or officials who are officially responsible for the interests of a political community. Okay, so...
legitimate authority. So here's what I wrote. What that means, this condition means that the war has to be launched by those that have official responsibility to represent the interests of a political community. So it cannot just be private parties or spontaneous uprisings. Um, that cannot be uh, the legitimate authorities to wage a morally acceptable war. The war has to be launched and initiated by people in a position of official responsibility for a political community or state. So who do you think could possibly serve in the role or occupy the role of these officials that have that actual responsibility to represent the interests of a political community? You have to be thinking of people like these, presidents, prime ministers, heads of state, monarchs, if such there be. But these have to be the recognized officials who are who bear the responsibility to oversee the interests of some political community. I say political community because there's a few different possible cases. This could be a nation state. This could be a civil war faction or revolutionary movement within an existing state if there's such a fight going on. Um, but who it can't be are just random individual private citizens or spontaneous uprisings. Suppose that I'm um, pissed off at Canada and I go over across the Canadian border intent on trying to, you know, take down the government of Canada or something. Would I be launching a war? Um, no, because me, a private citizen, I'm not vested with any kind of um, responsibility or obligation to oversee the interests of a political community. I don't represent the collected interests of the United States as a whole. I'm just a private party, so that would just be a crime waged by you know, a violent individual, which I would never do, but, you know, it's an example. Um, on the other hand, if it's the president of the United States who, in consultation with our, you know, military experts and others, makes uh, a decision to, you know, uh, deploy the military into a theater of war, you might say, well, this is a person who the American people have made a choice to represent and stand for their interests. He's empowered to uh, hold that position because of the legitimacy granted to him through the democratic process, which has appointed him to power, you know, so some kind of um, recognized procedure has placed this person at a seat of power where they're given the responsibility um, and also therefore the prerogative to act on our interests and as they see fit to use the military. So anyway, it has to be some kind of official head of state. Uh, it, in some states, there may not be one individual, but let's say a body of individuals uh, that is tasked with the formal duty of designating or launching war. Even in the United States, it's technically supposed to be Congress that launches the war, but uh, we've kind of gotten away from that in the past, say, 50 or 60 years or 70 years since World War II. There's been a lot more presidentially authorized uh, military uh, campaigns. Um, but anyway, it can't be a private citizen. It also can't be a spontaneous uprising. Suppose that um, me and a group of people are like protesting and picketing, um, you know, up there in the Capitol or Washington, and uh, we spontaneously decide, no, let's try to like attack um, a government building or whatever. Well, again, that group of people, even though now it's not just one individual, like in my previous example, but this group of people is not empowered to any kind of political process to make decisions on the behalf of all of us as a country. So again, that would be just a violent uprising by a mob not um, parties to the declaration of some official or legitimately declared war. Okay, so that's just one of our six just ad bellum conditions. The war has to be launched uh, by the proper authorities, basically. Okay, so if that makes sense, we move to the next of our six conditions of just ad bellum. But legitimate authority is always usually mentioned first because these are the people who have to, you know, make that critical decision. Um, okay, next is one of the most fundamentally important of all the six conditions, and that's the just cause requirement, or just cause. So the just cause condition means that you can't just start this war for any random reason. It has to be for a morally acceptable reason. Even if you have a legitimate authority, they can't just do it for fun, they can't just do it for you know, uh, conquest or um, seizing their wealth or um, occupying them or destroying a hated religious minority or something. It has to be for a morally acceptable reason. Now, what do you think could possibly be 
a morally righteous basis to wage war. We're not talking about a tactically ba best reason or a um, power uh, based reason. But what would make it morally acceptable such that even God, you know, as Aquinas would have argued, would have said, this is something that I condone. Well, a morally acceptable reason to wage war is generally thought of as a self-defensive decision to wage war, meaning that you're simply retaliating against an aggression that's been waged against you by another um, nation or political uh, community. So just cause. <clears throat> the war must be waged for morally acceptable reasons, and the clearest case of that is self-defense. Okay. Okay, just cause requirement means the war must be waged for morally acceptable reasons and, for example, given self-defense. Um, so let me tell you what would not be some just causes that would violate this uh, criteria. If the war was waged to commit genocide against certain people, uh, that would not be a morally acceptable reason. If it was done to persecute a religious minority, that would also not be acceptable. If it was done to simply expand empire, to annex territory, that currently uh, is not part of the aggressor nation's uh, territorial footprint. Um, it has to be defensive in nature. It has to be simply to protect the political community that these legitimate authorities have uh, author uh, authority and responsibility for, um, for overseeing their interests. Now, even when we say it has to be self-defensive, there's still some remaining questions about what self-defense even means. Some people talk about self-defense in the classic case. The clearest and most classic case is you're launching war uh, to repel a, an aggressor who's already attacked you first. So it's simply like they punched first, as it were. Now we are just defending ourselves. That's a classic case of self-defense. You reply in kind to a military offensive against you from an outside party. But some people believe that there could be preemptive or even preventive uh, actions that are also in the realm of self-defense. So let me talk to you about what those different cases are. A uh, preemptive act would be um, they have not attacked you yet. So in that sense, it's not pure self-defense because there's no attack that you're defending against, at least not yet. But if it was preemptive, it could be argued that, well, even though we have not yet, yet been attacked, we see that it is um, imminently going to happen and therefore we're going to make a first strike to you know, uh, defeat the adversary before they're able to attack us first. So as an, as an example from individual life, suppose that there's a person who's hovering around you with a big weapon, like a knife, and they're clearly threatening you with it, like I am going to stab you and I'm going to attack you with this knife, you know, get ready or whatever. Um, now, if they have not yet stabbed you, you might say, well, I'm still justified in striking them first because of the imminent threat that they pose to me. So some people believe that in the international context, if you're a nation who can clearly establish that there's an incoming attack that would happen and you have the means to uh, strike first, then this is still somehow, at least in the ballpark of self-defense, because again, you're simply defending against your own interests against an imminent attack. In the individual analogy, the pure self-defense case would be this person already poked or stabbed you with the knife and now you just it's on and you're gonna attack them back because you've actually suffered a wound. Um, preventive uh, articulations of self-defense doctrine are even more controversial because with the preventive case, it's not even that they are imminently going to attack, but that you judge that in time, down the line, eventually, they will be disposed and inclined to attack you. Um, that would be like the equivalent of a nation that doesn't see another nation ready to attack, but they think they're developing the means to attack slowly, maybe building up their military arsenal or getting into more um, aggressive military drills and overflights that indicate a future-oriented goal of attack. So that's where the self-defensive um, designation gets weakest, 
because it seems as though it's not as easy to justify that on the basis of mere self-defense. This would be like someone who tells you from across the country, yeah, I'm in New York right now, you're in California, but when I come down there, I'm going to get you, man. I'm going to really hit you up with, the, with an attack. You might say that if you had friends over there in New York that you told, please attack this person, uh, it's a little bit maybe premature because the, the materialization of the threat has not really fully formed yet, and it still might be in the realm of speculation whether it will ever happen. So, you know, like in World War II, when uh, the United States was bombed at Pearl Harbor, many people think that that's a clear case of when it was a morally justified self-defensive decision to enter into the war militarily because we'd already suffered an attack and now we need to fight against these Axis powers to bring back a peaceful status quo. Um, then you look at, say, I don't know, an example like um, the war in Iraq, uh, Definitely that's not self-defensive in the classic sense because Iraq never attacked us at all. Uh, but under Bush W, the argument was given that he's developing the means to eventually attack us by building weapons of mass destruction. We, we learned that that wasn't even true. But, you know, I'm just giving you a study in contrast. It's like some war, it's easier for their justification to be given for just cause than others. Um, but that's the difference. It's got to be self-defensive. And there's some distinctions between – I'll put this in the chat here, the, the written um, – typed out chat but Okay, classic, you're already attacked, preemptive, there's an imminent attack, preventive, there's some um, likely or possible future outcome where you could get attacked. Okay, now we've talked about two of the conditions. First, uh, legitimate authority. Second, just cause. Next, we have another minor of the six conditions, and this is um, the, <clears throat> the right intention requirement. Okay, so condition three, right intention. Um, okay, <clears throat> so the war also has to be waged on the basis of good intentions, which means that um, you must only intend to restore peace and not use the just cause as an excuse to wage war for unjust motives, okay? Okay, you must only intend to restore peace. That's got to be your good intention, not to just use this just cause as an excuse to wage the war for unjust motives that are perhaps unstated. Okay, so it's not enough to have a just cause and legitimate authority if you're using the just cause as a sort of cloak to conceal the true intentions of the warring nation. For example, suppose that there was a nation that was attacked by an, uh, a border nation, and they're like, okay, they've attacked us. Now we have a just cause. Nice. That gives us a perfect excuse and an opportunity to go in there and um, steal all of their oil resources, uh, which is our true motive. So our real intention is to get all that oil and money, but we're just using the just cause as a kind of like thin pretext to achieve this other non-moral motivation. So you have to maintain the desire to restore peace in the most orderly and efficient way to defend your own nation and its interests, but not to use the just cause as an excuse to wage war for other unjust motives. Suppose that there was a nation bordering another nation that had a religious minority that the one country really hated and wanted to eliminate. 
and then they happen to, let's say, fire an errant missile across the border into their territory, they may say, okay, well, I guess that's an attack. Let's go in there now, and let's just ethnically cleanse them from all people who practice this certain religion. Again, that would be using the just cause, such as it is, as a excuse to enter into the war for all these other n n ignoble motivations. So you have to both have a uh, legitimate authority and a just cause, but you have to operate throughout the war as though this just cause is the only reason that you're fighting, not for other um, unstated ulterior motives. Okay, so that's condition three, right intention. We still have a few more of just ad bellum. I told you, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas theory, it's quite detailed and rich. So there's a few more to mention. The next one is last resort. And that one is pretty, I think, self-explanatory in a way, even just based off the name, but we're still going to be giving an explanation. So last resort means that all non-military um, alternatives to war have to be attempted and fail first before you start the war. That means that the war will be something that you tried to prevent and you only did it because literally it was the last resort to resolve the dispute because all other available measures were attempted in good faith but failed. Okay, so last resort. Um, all non-military alternatives to war must be attempted first, and they must also fail first. All alternatives that are not military have to be attempted and fail before you finally resort to war as a last resort. This would ensure that it's a war of necessity rather than choice, because if you didn't exhaust all diplomatic and um, non-military alternatives to fighting in the war, then we didn't know if we really could have prevented it. Maybe you chose to enter into it, even though um, a negotiated solution or resolution uh, could have been met if you had just uh, attempted that. Okay, so, I mean, talking about our own war against Iraq, I'm sorry to say, but we didn't really give it a, a chance to exhaust the weapons inspections program that was ongoing at the time that we started to drop bombs on Baghdad. Um, so we kind of you know, entered into that war before we were able to see if there was a way of avoiding it by answering our questions about whether these weapon systems were being developed first. Um, I don't know, in the more recent uh, Russian uh, war against Ukraine, I don't think that they had a sincere or good faith effort to uh, sit at the table with Ukrainians and try to hammer out a diplomatic resolution um, to whatever, you know, let's say real or imagined uh, grievances they may have had with Ukraine. So again, you can see it as a war of choice rather than of last resort. Last resort is supposed to block off the possibility of fighting a war where you just go in before you even attempt to try and uh, solve it in a different way. Now, what are these alternatives to war that are being spoken of in the definition? Well, sometimes it's diplomacy, like uh, let's send diplomats to talk it out and try and exchange proposals as to what the interests of each nation are and through some mediated discussions come to a uh, mutually agreeable outcome. In other cases, it may be sanctions. Okay, let us try and punish the nation with non-military sanctions, maybe um, sanctioning their banks or their businesses or certain prominent individuals and seeing if this can possibly deter them from further uh, you know, military in, in, uh, conflict. But, um, you know, so there are some tools that are available that sometimes can be used to make war um, unnecessary. But if you tried them all and you made your best effort to see if that could fix the conflict and then you see that the conflict remains and there's still no resolution in sight, then perhaps we can say, all right, well, again, even God, uh, according to Aquinas, might be okay with war starting in that situation because um, the good faith um, moral actors on the side uh, fighting the just war uh, did what they could to avoid this and it seems like they were faced with no other alternative. Okay, so that's the fourth one, the last resort requirement. <clears throat> and just two more just ad bellum conditions. Next is the proportionality requirement. Um, there's actually two proportionality requirements, which we're going to see in just a moment. There's the military, uh, well, there's the political proportionality requirement, which is what this one is. It falls under just ad bellum. And then in just in bellum, when we get to it, there's only two just in bellum conditions. But one of them is the proportionality requirement 
for the conduct inside of war. And that is sometimes called the military proportionality requirement, as opposed to this more general political proportionality requirement. But let's talk about it, and I'll explain now. So the fifth condition here, of, under just ad bellum, conditions needed again to make the resort to war permissible, it's proportionality. Okay, so what has to be proportional, so to speak? Well, according to this requirement, the things that have to be balanced out and proportional are, on the one hand, the goods to be achieved by the war, and on the other hand, the harms and evils caused by the war and fighting it. So the claim is that if this was somehow like balancing scales, the weight of all the good results that follow from the war have to at least balance or hopefully even outweigh the weight of the bad uh, harms that those same war causes. But if the pain, death, misery, destruction, loss of life, property, etc., if that imposes more harm than whatever benefits the war achieves, then it's sort of like, what was the point? Why would we fight that war? That war wouldn't have been worth it because fighting it is going to cause more total harm than good. So we would have been better off not doing it. So proportionality requirement states that there has to be balance between the goods and evils the war causes. Every war is going to cause some amount of evil, right? Because by definition, it's going to involve killing and violence and destruction of precious things like life and money and property. The question is, is there enough good stuff that is caused by the war to offset all of these losses and harms? For example, have we liberated a religious minority from genocide or oppression? Have we secured the future of a free people that otherwise would have lived in a situation of enslavement or you know, whatever. Have we destroyed or eradicated a form of government that was totalitarian and oppressive? Or did we stop a bigger conflict that would have resulted in an even greater loss of life from having happened? Um, if you can add up all the goods and they outweigh the bads, then we've achieved proportionality. But if realistically speaking, it's just a bunch of death and destruction for no clear uh, benefit or advantage, then that doesn't seem to have been the right balance of good and evil. So anyway, proportionality. The... Um, the, to the, the good to be achieved by the war must be at least proportional to the evil caused by the war. Okay, and by the way, this proportionality requirement is sometimes known as the political one because it falls under just ad bellum. Um, now, <clears throat> I don't know, if I was going to say, to take a look at some co uh, co common examples from the recent past, I would look at, say, like um, the Iraq War, again, with America and Iraq. And, you know, a lot of people died. Um, 5,000 or more American service members died, and tens of thousands of others were wounded, some in very serious ways. And that's just talking about losses and harm on our side, not to mention the trillion plus dollars that we spent to prosecute the war. That's a lot of money that we taxpayers paid for. On the Iraqi side, um, even conservative estimates say that it, around 100,000 people had died, and some estimates go well beyond that. In a country the size just of California, that's a lot of lost life and also, of course, property damage and um, treasure expended. So look at all those harms on all sides, but compare it to what benefits. To what benefit? Um, did we make that place a fertile democracy? Did we liberate it from an oppressive dictator? I mean, ISIS kind of took over for a long time, and there is a government there with some degree of stability, but it's not necessarily um, transforming the status quo in that part of the world and making it so better for everybody. So in a way, some people think that we replaced one bad status quo with another that's equally bad. And we just had a lot, a lot, a lot of loss of life and treasure to, to pay for this non-improvement. So that might've been one that didn't satisfy proportionality. Um, I don't know, we fought the Afghanistan war ostensibly to topple the Taliban who had given some kind of either explicit or tacit support to Al-Qaeda who you know, launched the 9-11 attacks, they say. Um, but you know, we were there for 20 years. Um, a lot of people died uh, on all sides. And then when we left, it's the Taliban still in power. Um, so it's like no real major change to the status quo, um, uh, but a lot of loss and, of treasure and life to compensate for that. 
I don't know, in, in World War II perhaps, there's an easier case to be made that proportionality was achieved because by fighting that war, we and the Allies toppled Nazi Germany, stopping them from having even more broad power uh, around the globe um, and therefore bringing about like a Nazism and fascism to a greater uh, level of success. Maybe even the genocide of the Jewish people would have been fully accomplished or significantly more, uh, you know, uh, uh, death and destruction along those lines than had happened, even though 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. So anyway, preventing the worst possible outcomes from those wars, you might say it was worth the significant sacrifices made um, in order to achieve those benefits. So anyway, there's got to be enough good achieved through the war to outweigh whatever the costs are. The high costs of the conflict have to be worth it in terms of benefits um, secured. Now the final just ad bellum condition is also, this is also one I think that's quite easy to explain and understand. The name is a clear um, giveaway of what it means. But the final condition is just reasonable chance of success. <laughs> okay, so reasonable chance of success just means, as pretty much the name gives, that there has to be a reasonable chance that the uh, that the <clears throat> nations launching the war could come out victorious, could, could win, basically. There has to be a reasonable probability of victory. So suppose that all the other conditions were met. You had a war where... You know, you were attacked first, and you, all you want to do is get back to peace. So you have the right intention, and, you, you know, this war is being started by the president and the official leaders of that nation. Um, they tried everything else except for war to avoid this. Um, I mean, proportionality is going to kind of stand and fall with this in some sense as well. But, I mean, suppose that all or most of all the other conditions are met, but yet they're way overmatched. They're going in against a country that's maybe bigger, more wealthy, that has access to more, you know, heavy weapons and stuff. You might say that in that case, um, it's not a just war because despite all the other factors lining up, there's no realistic chance for that country to win. If you can't win, then you're fighting a war that's futile and bound to lead to your defeat. So it's like you're just leading people to their slaughter with no realistic chance for this, for the victory that they're fighting for the sake of to actually happen. So, um, you know, if the United States decided, or let me not put it the other way around, if say like um, Luxembourg or whatever had a problem with the United States and they wanted to attack us, or I don't know, Trinidad and Tobago, or like, uh, you know, some small nation, right, without a very big military, and they're like, let's launch an attack against the United States for this or that grievance. Even if they had legitimate reasons and everything else, it would not be very wise to enter that war because they'd be clearly overmatched and they would just be leading themselves to their annihilation against our much more superior military. I know some people have made that case about the whole uh, Ukraine and Russia thing because Ukraine definitely was attacked unprovoked by Russia, so they have a just cause to respond in kind. And it doesn't seem like there's any way they can negotiate a settlement with them because of the sort of outrageous demands that Russia's making to annex a lot of their territory. Um, so they seem to have satisfied most of the conditions, but then do they have a realistic chance of success? Some people attack it on that basis alone. Like, you know, it's, it's noble, it's valiant that they're fighting. But in the end, there's no way they'll be able to overcome a much more powerful military uh, organization like the Russians have got. Although I'm not so sure because they're getting a lot of support from the West and from all our allies. So in that case, um, maybe they do have at least some realistic chance to extend the war into a stalemate and maybe bring Russians to the table to negotiate a resolution. Anyway, just some food for thought. But now we've talked about all six conditions. So just war theory says that if all of those are met at once, then that's just war. Even Aquinas thought God would have felt that way. So again, if you have a fine and proper authority, right, legitimate um, government officials launching this war that are placed into that position through a recognized appointment of power, uh, then it's just cause. There's got to be just a self-defensive basis for doing it. And then you got to have the right intention where all you intend to do is to just get back to peace, not to use this for some kind of other less noble, unstated reason. You've tried everything else first, so you got to the point of last resort. And it seems like by fighting this war, good things will result that outweigh the costs as bad as they may be. 
And also you've got a realistic chance to win. And all those six things are met. Now it seems morally permissible to fight the war and it's a righteous, just war. Um, but we said also there's the two other, uh, there's the other set of conditions and principles, and those are called just in bellow conditions. So before we end today, or at least for this lesson, I should say, I want to put on the table what are the two just in bellow conditions. Okay, so here are just in bellow conditions. There's just two of them. <laughs> So one of the just in bellow conditions, again, what are these? These are conditions that have to be met, not for the launching and starting of war to be permissible, but for the conduct of the soldiers that are engaged in the war to be morally permissible. So it's about the conduct rather than the launch. So conduct within. So the first condition is known as the discrimination principle. Principle of discrimination. Okay, the principle of discrimination, it doesn't mean discrimination in like the sense of, you know, racial discrimination and stuff like that. Um, although that's kind of a special case of the more general meaning of the word. It's discrimination in the sense of being able to tell two things apart, to being able to discriminate A from B, distinguishing them from each other, basically. Like, can you discriminate a, um, <clears throat> a, um, a husky dog from a wolf? Like, meaning, can you tell the difference if you saw a wolf on the one side and a husky, would you be able to discriminate between them? telling things apart. The principle of discrimination in this context means that there have to be every active effort given to distinguish between these things out there on the battlefield, um, legitimate military targets, and on the other hand, innocent non-combatants. So you have to try to always distinguish between the two and never deliberately attack the innocent non-combatants. Maybe some of them will unfortunately get caught up in a crossfire and be collateral damage or something, but they can never be the intended targets. You have to at least try to make a good faith effort to distinguish between civilians and military personnel and only attack legitimate military targets. So principle of discrimination, uh, every effort must be made to not uh, deliberately attack non-combatants. Every effort must be made to not deliberately attack non-combatants. So um, you always got to try and make sure that you don't, you know, just indiscriminately attack everybody. Like anything that moves, I'm just going in there, guns blazing, I'm just going to blow a carpet bomb, whole cities, I don't care who it hurts, I'm just going to attack the country as a general phenomenon. No, uh, you have to try and be more discriminating than that. You have to be a little bit more precise. You're supposed to try your best to avoid taking deliberate actions that would harm non-combatants. Now, who are non-combatants? They would be unarmed individuals that are not engaged in hostilities. Could it be women, children, or those that are injured on the battlefield, which technically are supposed to be taken in as prisoners of war and kept until the conclusion of hostilities, not summarily executed as they're now defenseless um, in a wounded state on the battlefield. So combatants are never supposed to intentionally target those individuals. So like, suppose that there was a country that said, I know how we're going to really uh, hurt this country. Let's just attack all their children's hospitals or blow up their you know, daycare centers or the places where senior citizens are you know, convalescing. Um, if they started blowing up you know, school grounds and places like those where a lot of non-combatants are or just indiscriminately firing onto apartment buildings and ho host houses, I should say, or homes, um, you might say, well, this is a nation that's off the rails, indiscriminately waging war, making no deliberate efforts to confine the hostilities to those that are actually fighting back against them. Military aged men holding weapons would be the clearest examples of legitimate military targets, so that's fair game. Um, but again, you're not supposed to kill these you know, important non-combatants that are just uh, everyday people not engaged in the war on their own. Now, um, <clears throat> it's become a little more complex in the modern era, to be fair, to make this precise uh, division between the combatants and non-combatants, because today a lot of warfare is urban warfare, a lot of times it's guerrilla warfare, where people are not necessarily donning official military uh, uniforms, and they may not have uh, insignia, which identify them as a member of the military, 
So to the extent that you have people fighting um, urban warfare that are just looking like they're dressed in civilian clothes, blending in the civilian population, it makes the distinguishing between those that are engaged in fighting and not a little bit harder. But you still have to make good faith efforts to do it according to this principle. The principle doesn't require perfect accuracy, like no innocent person is ever uh, inadvertently killed, but they have to be inadvertent. It has to be that they were somehow just, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time, and maybe our weapon systems couldn't have possibly, um, you know, perfectly well secluded them from violence, but uh, they're not the intended targets at any rate, at least not if this condition was going to be met. Um, and again, with the Russia-Ukraine, we've seen a lot of footage coming back of hospitals and apartment buildings being blown up. Um, so to the extent that that's something that was done in a targeted way on purpose, it would definitely be a violation of this principle. But the Allies did such things back in World War II. I mean, it's true that uh, there was carpet bombing of cities like Dresden uh, when we were fighting against the Nazis, and many of those uh, military uh, campaigns at the time could have been criticized on a similar basis. So, it, you know, there's always some historical analogs. Uh, to anything going on right now. Okay, and so last point of just in Bello. I told you that proportionality appears on both lists, and that's true. So here's proportionality part two coming back again. Um, so the just in Bello version of proportionality says this. This is known as the military proportionality requirement. And it's supposed to say, not that the total costs of the overall war have to be less than the total benefits of the overall war, but now we're limiting our focus to just individual military actions and operations in the war. And this condition says that the uh, minimum level of force is to be used to achieve the military objective, but no, no more than that. So you're supposed to be efficient and minimalist in the use of targeted force, not therefore to use overkill, to use more force than is justified in um, meeting a military objective. So. <clears throat> The nation, I mean, probably instead of nation, I should have said like the military because it's not the whole nation fighting. So may I make one correction? <clears throat> military generals and officers that are fighting in the field, this is a better way of putting it, if I may. The military must use the least force that is needed to achieve the military objective. So whenever a specific mission or objective is being undertaken by the fighting forces, they should try to do it in the most surgical and precise way to use no more force than is absolutely required to achieve that goal. So let me speak about what could violate this if, if there's more force than is proportional to the value of the target or objective. Suppose there was one high value target that we wanted to kill uh, by using our military forces in a war. And we only knew this, that the, pro that the coordinates or the location of the person is known only to within uh, 100 square miles. So we say, well, we can't exactly identify the location they're at, but we know they're in this whole 100 mile square footage area. So how about we just drop a nuclear bomb on that whole city and just destroy the whole thing, and then we know we'll get the one guy. Well, is that the least amount of force that is needed to kill one person? No. Um, it would be way overkill, and you would definitely have a whole bunch of innocent lives lost in the same effort. So this just says that you're supposed to make the level of violence used for any individual assignment no greater than the needs that the assignment uh, <clears throat> demands. So if I went in and... Um, you know, carpet bomb a whole city, get one person, that would certainly violate proportionality. Um, so there has to be some kind of balance achieved between the means of destruction and the value of the objectives. Um, so there you go. So now we've talked about just ad bellum and just in bellow conditions. If the in bellow conditions are met, then the conduct of the soldiers is fine, morally speaking. They're making every effort to distinguish between real live military targets and innocent individuals. And on the other hand, they also make sure that the force they're using is not excessive. It's not excessive to the needs of the military operation. They may use force, of course, that's the nature of war, but they're not supposed to go in there and um, you know, use more force than is absolutely necessary because uh, you know, it, it, it goes beyond then what's proportional. Now, <clears throat> that's all I have for the first of our lessons on this war, terrorism, and torture subject. So we got as far today in this meeting uh, as talking about the theory of just war the three main positions on the justification of warfare and some interesting related comments.
Uh, as we continue next time, we'll talk a little bit more about debates concerning the moral justification of terrorism and torture. And then we will swing right into our first author on this, who is Douglas Lackey, um, who is a pacifist and who defends pacifism. Um, so we'll hear the pacifist argument, the argument that basically anti-war pacifists give to stand up their position. And then when we finish him in the next lecture unit, or well, in the next lecture that follows right after that, it'll be um, uh, Jan Narvison who argues actually no, pacifism is wrong and it cannot be morally supported. So we hear the pacifist argument, the anti-pacifist argument, and uh, that's the next couple of pieces coming up. So thanks everybody for watching for now. Um, I'm gonna let you go and have a good one and uh, uh, I'll see you soon as we post more lectures in the coming days. I'll be ready to uh, send back your grades on the midterm by the end of the week. I just need some more time to finish them, but for now, everything's in good order. So thanks again. Um, have a good one, and I will talk to you soon. Okay, bye.